Hello, good morning. Welcome to Joy News Desk. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokum Limli. Coming up, name, shame and prosecute all individuals involved in illegal mining. Some radical solutions. Panelists on the Joy News National Dialogue on Illegal Mining are advocating to deal with the growing menace. That more scale mining would only happen in places that we've done the surveys in. And then the trimaque that we are doing would have to stop. Meanwhile, Deputy Attorney General Alfred Chayaboa has defended judicial decision in Aisha Wang's case, emphasizing application of old mineral and mining acts over new legislation, which could have handed her a 15 year jail term. Well, details the time that. Yes. It's the very time that you use when you are being punished. If you committed an offense in 2015 and the punishment then was punishment, why? And you are tried in 2020 and where that law has even been repealed, per our laws, when it comes to punishment, you cannot be punished under the new law. And Education Minister defends the decision to reopen schools for first-year SHS students barely a week after placement. We're live in various senior high schools across the country for checks on the situation. We're also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and X via Joy News on TV. My personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. Please stay for details. Name, prosecute and shame all individuals involved in illegal mining. Also pass stringent laws. Those are just some of the many radical solutions panelists on Joy News' National Dialogue on Illegal Mining suggested to deal with the Galamse Kanka. Illegal mining has become a pervasive issue in numerous communities. Vast forested lands have become obliterated, leaving water bodies clouded with toxic heavy metals. The widespread devastation has deeply affected many. Panelists at the Joy News National Dialogue on Illegal Mining passionately address the severity of this menace. The Chamber of Minds thinks the country is under siege. This and gentlemen, my environment is under siege. No two ways about it. Even government institutions like the Forestry Commission consider the activities of illegal miners as an ecological disaster. In brief, I would say what we saw was an ecological disaster. Mm. And um, this is not something we should countenance as a country. Executive Director of Water Aid, Irabna Yanye Akufu, agrees. What is happening in Galamse affected areas is an extreme act of violence against our water resources. It is a hydrocide. This is genocide against generations, and silence only ends, only aids our oppressors. Dr. Bob Mantel from the Center for Climate change at the University of Ghana emphasized that the core issue lies in government's failure. The problem we face is a, a governance failure and a collective action failure. Small-scale mining has been around for several years. 34 years ago, there were less than 100,000 people involved. Now, the industry supports more than 3 million people. Martin Aisi is the CEO of the Minerals Commission. Save as the lawyers we see, I'm one of them, Greater Accra, Volta, and Oti where I come from. And it's a matter of time, I'm seeing gold in Oti. I see the data every day. And then you move from 50 to 100,000 people to now an activity that supports 3 million, directly and indirectly. The impact of Galamse on the environment is far-reaching. Professor Frimpong Boatin highlights that the soil yield in mining areas has significantly diminished. So we also have loss of biodiversity. The, the physical danger, apart from the physical danger to humans and animals, maybe you fall in pits and you get drowned. We have polluted land farms, farmlands, loss of edibles such as mushrooms, snails, wild yams, plantain and bananas. The water bodies have turned murky laden with heavy metals from illegal mining operations that use them for gold extraction. Despite this, the Ghana Water Company asserts its commitment to maintaining stringent quality standards. 
Stanley Marty speaks for them. There's no way we'll compromise on our integrity. There's no way we'll compromise on um, um, our quality standards. Mm. Now, currently, Ghana Water Computer Limited is ISO compliant. But CEO of the Minerals Commission asserted that he wouldn't permit his children to drink it. I have drunk pipe bone water all my life. Now I will not ask my four children to drink pipe bone water. I have my doubts as to what Stanley was saying anyway because I see some of the things that come out. The Forestry Commission for the first time admitted that over 30 forest reserves across the nation are currently being exploited by illegal miners. Hugh Brown represented the commission. Out of our 288 forest reserves, 34 of them have issues with illegal mining. A number of them with excavators. Um, I think since May, two more have come to join, so we are now around 36 forest reserves. He says the commission is not equipped to deal with the armed miners who protect some of these mining sites. Last year, November 1st, the military detachment was withdrawn. So, I mean, I'm the executive director of the Forest Services Division. It's my task. just so we know on who told us. I, I wouldn't know. They were withdrawn. I'm out. The we're forest told, commission was not communicated no, to? No, we're told they were undertaking um, some exercise to clean up the system because uh, there were some lapses. So, and they are not back yet. We've been persistently asking for that support. On December 4, 2023, a well-known Galamse kingpin, Aisha Wan, was convicted for mining offenses after years of litigation. She was only sentenced to four and a half years in prison in addition to a fine of 48,000 Ghana cities. Professor Frimpon Boatin says she should have been sentenced to a minimum of 15 years. I believe that the law was changed and the minimum sentence was supposed to be 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I know. Martin Aisi says we need more of such convictions to deter people from indulging in illegal mining. We need to see more of the Aisha one. Okay, that's number one. So this one lady, they have to be arrested you know, taking to the trial, and then we must see that people are being punished. The consensus among the panelists and attending guests is unanimous. The issue of illegal mining must be brought to an end. Mohamed Adam Suparu, the member of parliament for Sisala West constituency and a member of the Lands Committee in Parliament, stressed that acknowledging the country's failure is the first step towards solving this critical issue. We have failed our people. We have failed as leaders. We must admit that we have failed. Then we start looking out for solutions. Dr. Ken Ashibe, the convener of the Media Coalition Against Illegal Mining, emphasized that the trial and error approach extensively used in illegal small-scale mining needs to become a thing of the past. We need to now insist that small-scale mining would only happen in places that we've done the surveys in and that the trimaque that we are doing would have to stop. Okay. That should we And finally, uh, my senior brother, he said that there's no law that says you can't mine in uh, forest reserves. We should insist that parliament passes a law that's places of global, uh, by, uh, what, what did they even say, global significant biodiversity areas should not be mined at. So we should ensure that there is an explicit law that says that that should not happen. Okay. And finally, Hugh Brown, speaking on behalf of the Forestry Commission, advocated for providing illegal miners with more lucrative alternative livelihoods to steer them away from illegal mining sites. And I believe going forward, we need to see how best, first of all, number one, we can strengthen law enforcement. How we can get all these sectors who are supposed to be there to enforce the laws and uh, undertake prosecutions to work in tandem. We need to identify and implement alternative livelihood schemes. Dr. Frimpong Boatin suggested that the Ministry of Agri could initiate planting certain crops like sunflower and cabbages, which have the capability to absorb heavy metals. So I said that it would be very dangerous to eat vegetables, especially salads, greens, from many areas because of the pollution. And that is why we do what we call phytoremediation. And I think the Ministry of Agriculture should think about these things. We need to plant certain 
things that to absorb or take out the poison, uh, the metals in the body. So we know that if you plant sunflower, uh, it will absorb magnesium and chromium. Broccoli, uh, cabbage and broccoli will take care of lead, zinc, and cadmium. So also water lettuce, which will absorb cadmium, mercury, chromium, and copper. But how do we end all of this once and for all? Professor Frimpon Boatin has an interesting answer. So the radical solution mm -hmm. is that people, big people, including journalists who are involved, should stop. Okay. <laughs> and then. Um, okay. How do we make? How do we make them stop? How do we make them stop? I wish maybe we could shoot them all them up. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> A High Court Judge Justice Lady Ose Mafo wants an amendment to the Minerals and Mining Act to go after chiefs and farmers who give out their lands to illegal miners. The judge in her remark in court on Tuesday during the trial of Aisha Wan said it is not enough to prosecute only illegal miners. The Galamse Kingpin has been jailed four and a half years in addition to a 48,000 Ghana cities fine. Her ladyship Lady Ose Mafo said prosecuting chiefs who give out land so illegal miners will help win the fight against Galamse. James Aveji has a wrap from what happened yesterday in court. Aisha Wang, a month ago, pleaded not guilty to three counts, including illegal mining, facilitating the participation of persons in Galamse, and illegally employing foreigners, except the fourth count on illegally entering Ghana, which she pleaded guilty to. She was handed a 3,000 penalty unit and a four and a half year prison term for illegal mining and facilitating Galamse. Again, Justice Lydia Osei Mafo also handed her a 12 month prison term for illegally employing foreigners and a 1,000 penalty unit and a three year prison term for re entering Ghana without legal travel document. All sentences are to run concurrently which means Aisha Wang will spend four and a half years in jail and pay the fine in addition. Right after Justice Lydia Osei Mafo read her judgment, counsel for the accused, Miracle Atachi, rose to his feet and prayed the court to consider the accused on the basis that she has complied with the court and security officials since her arrest late last year. He said sentencing her would only put a financial burden on the state. He pleaded with a judge to find and repatriate her. But Director of Public Prosecutions Yvonne Atakra Obobisa argued against his plea. She wants her ladyship to impose a maximum jail term plus a fine on the accused. Justice Lydia Osei Mafo in her remarks noted that considering all evidence provided by prosecution, she is left with no doubt that Aisha Wang's actions have been detrimental to the environment and have deprived many of their livelihood. She said the accused has taken the country's hospitality for granted. Justice Osei Mafo also added that security officials did not do due diligence in granted her papers Upon her second return, in view of these, the judge wants the state to go after chiefs and other landowners who give out their land to illegal miners. Aisha Wang will serve the next four and a half years in prison and pay some 48,000 Ghana cities to the state in fine. Deputy Attorney General Alfred Trian Yeboa says he is satisfied with the conviction. Yes, we are satisfied. You know, this offense was committed before 2019, that was between 2015 and 2017. And the law then was that the maximum sentence should be five years. So having been in custody for over 12 months, based on a constitutional provision on the, uh, which imposes a duty on the judge to consider the number of years that a person has spent in custody, we think that four years, six months is reasonable in the circumstance. So someone that has gotten her name in the media a lot. Today, she's come to the end of the road. We're able to successfully prosecute her. She's going to spend four years, six months in custody. It should be a lesson to the others that you may be engaging illegal mining, but when your time comes, the law will deal with you in accordance with what we've had. So it's a fight that we have not won, 
the fact that it's a continuous one, as I just said, we all need to take part in the fight. Aisha is going today. The next time we come to court, if others have committed similar offences, they, they also have their day in court. But let me also make this appeal to the public. This fight is not a fight of the Attorney General. This fight is not a fight of the police service. It is our fight. If you have any evidence to the fact that an individual, group of individuals or an entity is engaging in illegal mining, don't sit in your house. Offer that evidence to the security agents so that we can follow up and then prosecute them as we've done in this particular case. I mean, would the state be able to ensure that she's deported? We know she has had issues going out and coming back into the country. After her sentence, if she's be able to serve her sentence, she will be de 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 deported in accordance with law. James Averges report for joy. The National Association of Small Scale Miners is recommending to government to consider a local community enforcement approach instead of the centralized national approach. According to the General Secretary of the Miners Association, Godwin Ama, the current national approach has failed to yield positive results. He was speaking at the National Dialogue on Illegal Mining. But we think that community enforcement approach is going to work. If we want to, we shouldn't look at it from the national level, but we should look at it from the base, from the communities. Mining activity or illegal operation takes place in the communities. So if we are able to have what we call the community enforcement approach, where we have selected individuals from the community and the traditional leaders to be part, then Minerals Commission will let them know the small-scale miners or mining companies that have been issued with license to work within their jurisdiction. Anyone who comes there who is not part of that list should not be allowed to work. We did a pilot and realized that it's working. So this is something that we need to upscale it. That one is not waiting for the central government to come. And these uh, communities are linked to the district mining committees. So we work with the district mining committees that at the end of the day, we get these things done. When it comes to of chemical use, we are working with uh, the University of Mines. We've done a lot of sensitization through the ASM radio school. That is small scale, doing a lot of advocacy, sensitization. And uh, the UMAT came up with what we call the retorts. These retorts, when you have your mercury, you melt them in the retorts, and then you don't do open burning. But it's still not upscaled. The, the university needs funds to upscale it. Senior Research Fellow and Lecturer at the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability Studies of the University of Ghana, Dr. Bob Mantel, indicates that following the failure of political class to fight the menace, a citizens' movement, especially the middle class, is needed to push the agenda. She take responsibility, and taking responsibility means holding our leaders accountable. You know, we shouldn't just leave them. We have to be there front and center advocating for changes, making sure that we are naming people and advocating for the arrest and prosecution. If we the people are quiet, especially the middle class, if we are quiet, this thing will never stop. Some of this conversation, this dialogue should continue. As somebody said, we need to move it away from just being an English elitist kind of conversation. We need to go down to people, uh, speaking people's languages in local places. It is a way of sensitizing. It's a way of creating awareness. It's a way of breaking down the complexities so people understand. We need to humanize the Galamse problem. It has become a political and economic problem for too long. We now we need to show the health implications, the water implications, all the things that are surrounding uh, 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 are coming up as impacts should be showcased in local communities. And that is where we can make progress. On the need to amend the law, the Deputy Attorney General Alfred Chayabua says he will work with the Lands Commission regarding the allocation of lands. He spoke on PM Express. But you, you, you may have to get it. That's why she made a, this kind of recommendation that the law must be amended specifically to cater for that one. Okay, so in other words, the law must be amended to say if you give your land out to illegal miners, then you are also liable to be prosecuted under the amended act. Exactly. Exactly. And now, Fortunately for us, we use the landowners. The only problem is that if you have such a law, the owners will not come up to give evidence. We need for somebody us. to testify against exactly. somebody. So in this particular case, six of them. Deal, yes, of course you can, you can always do a, 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 yes, yeah, that's it. Yes, So if you have such, such a law, it's a matter of just bargaining with them 
using them as accomplice witnesses to prosecute. In, in, in some respect, it will actually help you get people to testify because if they know if you caught them and you say, I'm going to plea, I mean, do a plea bargaining with you. If you do this, you're possibly going to get a reduced sentence or some, some sort of. I think so. So that, judge, that could help you. Yeah, the judge made that. Because now you have to convince them. They have to be of, of, of good, you know, just, just love this country to just want to come for it, right? But this one can actually help you to force them to do so. I agree with you on that. So is it something that you embrace? We embrace it. That you would, you will, will, are we going to see an amendment to the law because of the judge's suggestion? We, we need to discuss it. Ali, the Minister of uh, uh, Lands and Natural Resources, they are the minister responsible for all this. So they may also have to look at the law. Mm. We need to but the AG's department, you are for this. You are for amendment to, to also make the giving out of land for Galante. Exactly. If you give out your land, now we see cocoa farmers giving out their lands. Mm. You tell them they, they, they are so bold to come on, on, on set and say, yes, that's my cocoa farm. I remember watching a video. True, the best, yes, that's absolutely. my cocoa farm. Many, many that's my farm. I, I sell it and so what? So we may have to look at that stage and perhaps bring it in, into our law so that if you give your land out to anybody to do illegal mining, if it's legal mining, you don't have the kind of right to give land to any apart from the government mm. when it comes to mining. But people do it and then eventually people go in and do illegal mining. Let's go to Parliament because President Ecofuado has told Parliament he is unable to sign some crucial bills passed by Parliament into law due to some constitutional issues. In July, Parliament passed bills abolishing the death penalty and prescribing accusation of witchcraft as well as criminalizing the work of which finders but in a letter to the speaker of parliament read to the house president ecofado argued the bills imposed a charge on the consolidated fund and such bills must come from the executive and not as from private members the president says the government will soon present such bills on the same subject before parliament i'm writing to you in reference to our meeting held on 28th november 2023 at my office, where we discussed the outstanding bills presented for assent, namely the Criminal Offences Amendment Bill 2023, the Criminal Offences Amendment Number 2 Bill 2023, and the Armed Forces Amendment Bill 2023. During our conversation, I raised specific constitutional concerns regarding these bills related to Article 108 of the Constitution, particularly the nature of these bills, which were introduced into Parliament as private members' bills, rather than being presented by or on my behalf. I appreciated the opportunity to engage with you in a meaningful dialogue about these critical legislative matters and valued your insights on the subject. As I indicated, the contents of these bills have my support, but we need to ensure that they are enacted in line with established constitutional and legislative processes. Thus, after thorough consideration and in light of the constitutional issues appointed at during our meeting, I am unable to assent to these bills. The concerns raised are significant and have profound implications for the constitutional integrity of these legislative actions. Any legislation we pass must be in complete alignment with the provisions of our constitution. I intend to have these bills reintroduced in Parliament on my behalf in due course. I thank you for your cooperation in this matter. Yours sincerely, Nana and still in Parliament, Minister for Education Dr. Yari Duchum has defended the government's decision to reopen senior high schools barely a week after school placement was released. This decision generated some controversy with teacher unions kicking against the decision, whilst Parliament last week urged the minister to reconsider the decision by providing a briefing on the situation to MPs on the matter. The minister cited the early release of the harmonized prospectus as well as the desire to revert the academic calendar on track as part of the reason why this decision was taken and why they refused to reverse the decision. The minority were not impressed with the response of the minister. Last week, Parliament had urged the Education Minister to reconsider that decision to let students reopen barely a week after the placement had been done. The minister did not oblige. Today, he has been providing some answers in terms of why exactly his ministry 
had to do that. He's been explaining that governments wants to bring back the academic calendar back on track. For the first time, the Ministry of Education, with its relevant agencies and stakeholders, developed a national harmonized prospectus for all senior high school and TVS students. And the same was published in the Daily Graphic on November 15th, 15, 2023. The purpose of the publication was, among other things, to give parents ample time to buy the prospectus items and get their awards ready for school on December 4th, 2023. Mr. Spain, these timelines are strictly followed. The contact hours will be duly achieved. And our quest to get back to the pre-COVID academic calendar will be on track. Last year, school opened in February for first year students. This year, we are opening in December, which gives us the opportunity to then open October or September and therefore go back to the pre-COVID calendar as we all are envisaging. But clearly the minority are not happy with the responses the minister has given. Shortening the process, introducing a harmonized prospectus, well and good. But what quantum of money does a parent need to be able to buy all the items on the harmonized prospectus? Just because even the cost of a top box, I'm not even talking about a trunk, is more than 200 Ghana cities. And we are not even going to go through the list and talk about every single item. But my own rough estimates, at the very minimum, a parent will not require less than 3,000 Ghana cities. Minimum, I said minimum, Mr. Speaker, minimum threshold. As of this return to the pre-COVID era, I don't know why the sudden rush. You have not been in any hurry at all to return to the pre-COVID calendar. Even in terms of the final exams, we are longer writing WASI with our colleagues in Gambia, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and the rest. Uh, now it's, it's Gassi, and you are not in a hurry to move from Gassi. Speaker, I'm urging him that please let him extend, extend the time for, for the uh, public, particularly those who have had their children and relatives uh, who have had an opportunity to, to go to these schools to be able to organize enough and then so that they can be able to uh, uh, assess this education of their choice. On the majority side, however, the concerns generally has been that Parliament did not have the power to direct the Minister in terms of what to do in running his ministry day to day. The concern has also been that the Education Ministry was right in taking that decision because of the urgent need to bring back the academic calendar on track. And the students are in school already. The minister had given us the statistics of the number of students that had been placed. Unfortunately, we probably do not have the number of students that have reported at the various schools. Clearly, this was not a sudden decision. This was not a sudden decision. But there is something important, Mr. Speaker, I want to point out here. We as a political class must know what to play politics with and what we should congregate around as a national issue. Well, clearly the Minister for Education has not listened to the concerns that came from Parliament. He had decided that the decision to let school reopen should stand. And as we speak, some students have already started reporting to school and it will be very difficult to go back on the decision that has been taken. And clearly as both members on each side have been saying, there is the urgent need for the minister and as well as other governmental agencies to listen when parliament speaks. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. Now, some parents and guardians of first year senior high school students have called on government to move the reopening date to a later date to enable them prepare adequately to provide the needed prospectuses as they race against time to meet the school's deadlines.
A week after junior high school graduates received postings to senior high schools, the Ghana Education Service ordered them to report to school. Teacher unions and members of parliament have raised the objections to this decision. The GES, however, is defending its decision, insisting it wants to restructure the SHS academic calendar. Some parents say pooling resources to buy essential items for their first year's wards a short notice has left them stressed. I'm sending him back home. (laughs) <laughs> I couldn't buy all of the, his items, so I have to go back home. Aside from the short notice, parents are also questioning the agency for their children to go to school when they will break for Christmas in just two weeks. Mary Gifty Nyachiga is a senior high school teacher. She's unhappy with the GES decision. Looking at teachers staying on campus throughout the year because of how the curriculum has been structured for our kids, in fact, it's, it's unbearable. It's unbearable and I think, I mean, governments have to look into it again. A Form 1 male Achimoto school student whose gender was altered to female by Wayek has yet to be corrected. I chose St. James as my first choice, but the Wayek people changed my gender to female. So I couldn't choose a boys' school, a single-sex school, so I had to choose a mixed school. So when I chose a mixed school, I chose Achimoto and, I, and, I, and, I, now, and I'm now here. More queues are expected at the premises of the various senior high schools in the coming days as parents and guardians rush to get the awards admitted. In the Ashanti region, some guardians of newly admitted students in second cycle schools are prevailing on the government to consider an extension of the reopening dates. The parents say they are financially challenged to meet the needs of the awards in the preparation for school. Meanwhile, hundreds of non placed students in and beyond the region continue to wait in line at the regional solution center to resolve their concerns. Authorities at Kumasi Academy announcing specific items required of their newly admitted students. Students were to report to school on Monday. Unlike some senior high schools requiring an online admission, the fresh students are admitted manually. Moving in queues, the students are required to confirm their details at the various decks after which they are offered accommodation. Last Friday also, I came here. Uh, you know, when you you, you print the, what do you call, the resource list. The prospectus okay. is added to So all the things that have, we, we bought them and then we have brought them. So meaning your son is ready to start yes. school today? Yes, my son is ready to do the science. He's ever ready. Today he woke up around four o'clock. But other guardians are concerned about the reopening dates. They allude that financial challenges are impeding preparations for their awards. I traveled from Tema. This has become a burden. They should consider reopening next month. I don't think my ward would really lend during this semester because this is the same period for admission. I traveled from Sefibe Kwai to this place. Next year, next year, they should consider a few weeks for preparation. At the Regional Solutions Center, hundreds continue to wait in line to seek redress to issues pertaining to their school placements. Many are stranded after they visited the center in the previous week to have their concerns resolved. But a solution to their concerns has yet to see the light of day. I came here on Thursday. I've been sitting here all morning, but we don't know what's happening. My son had a Jusuman. He was offered today, but it's far from where we live, so it will be a challenge. Four to five hours they be I came here with my children, but we have since not been served. We have other duties to attend to. 
Over 100,000 of this year's BEC candidates were not placed through the computerized school selection and placement system. Out of the number, 61,375 have been placed through self-placement, with nearly 44,000 remaining to be placed nationally. Ashanti Regional Coordinator of the Free SHS Secretariat, Owusu Brobe, is assuring the stranded parents and students of immediate placements. We had a little uh, issue with our system. Now it has been resolved. So very soon, those who came here around Wednesday, Thursday, their issues are under control. So very soon, all the backlog will be cleared for students to get a place. They shouldn't panic and they shouldn't fall into these Goro boys, pay money to fix them here and there. For Joy News, my name is Emmanuel Bright Quick. Member of Parliament for North Town, Samuel Okujetua Blackwa, has indicated there's no 24 hour economy policy currently in practice as being preached by the governing NPP. He says the government's attempt to introduce a half cooked policy with focus on night economy in its 2024 budget was an afterthought. Speaking to Joy News at the National Democratic Congress stand, at the ongoing voter trade and investment fair in Ho, he asserted the NDC's 24-hour economy policy proposal is the panacea to Ghana's economic crisis. The National Democratic Congress took a stand at the ongoing voter trade and investment fair at the Jubilee Park in Ho to sell its 24-hour economy policy proposal to exhibitors and patrons. James Gunu is the Volta Regional NDC Secretary. Whilst people are selling shoes, whilst people are selling belts um, and other products, we also have a product that we want the industry players to take advantage of because we want to revive the economy of Ghana. And it doesn't take 20, uh, uh, I mean, eight hours to do. Other NDC members set points on the 24-hour economy policy proposal and its prospects. And I want to say that if you have, say, everywhere here, that does 10,000 bottles a day, per the 24-hour arrangement, it means that if you can do 30,000 during the night, it will give you special tariff that you can use. If you can give the government the assurance that you employ more, then you can enjoy certain tax breaks. So as for the benefit of the 24-hour economy policy proposal, it's numerous. 1.6 million Ghanaians are currently unemployed. So the first thing, jobs, jobs, jobs. More money in your pocket for the ordinary Ghanaian. Cheaper goods that you can access and buy for the ordinary Ghanaian. Um, the young people need jobs and sustainability and more importantly very sustainable jobs and the only way that can be realized under the this economic condition is for people to work for 24 hours so with the 24 hours opportunities are created the Member of Parliament for North Town, Samuel Okujetu Ablakwa, shot down a claim by the governing New Patriotic Party that the 24-hour economy policy is already in practice. So this policy intervention that President Mahama is proposing will unleash the full potential of young people, create jobs, we will have a, a three-shift system where companies will work 24 hours, they will get incentives when they sign up to the policy, including tax rebates, including special uh, discounted rates on utilities, so that this will then lead to massive industrialization, so that there will be economic growth and prosperity for all, that there is no 24-hour economy in practice. There's no such policy. It is in the 2024 budget that they try to talk about a night economy, but you see it's an afterthought because of President Mohammed's 24 hour economy proposal. Where is the, I'm a member of parliament, where is the blueprint, where is the policy? Where is the legislation, the, the legislation that is backing the so-called 24 hour economy? It doesn't exist. Fred Kwame Asari, join
Government has released funds for the completion of the Afari Military Hospital in the Ashanti region after the project stalled uh, due to financial constraints. Completion date for the 500-bed capacity hospital has repeatedly been shifted after construction began decades ago. Project contractors Eurojet the Invest are optimistic of completing the facility by end of the first quarter of 2024. The 500-bed capacity of a military hospital has 50 medical and non-medical buildings with 15 operating theaters. It has nine delivery rooms with two endoscopy operating rooms. The hospital will also have a medical gas plant for production of five medical gases. All buildings are already completed with some furniture installed awaiting medical equipment. Financing for the hospital project stalled, resulting in the long halt of work on the facility that was at an advanced stage of completion. Presidential Advisor on Health, Dr. Anthony Insiasari, reviews the necessary funds have been released for the project to progress. No contractor will come to site if he doesn't have liquidity. <laughs> Especially if he sees that uh, if you don't take care, it will be paid. They have received liquidity, but they have to we'll continue giving them the money through the Ministry of Finance for them to the flow of the liquid. If it flows very fast, then things will be very fast. But what we have seen here today, we also will brief Ministry of Finance. And I'm sure Ministry of Defense came here. I saw some story that they were here last Friday also. Yeah, and, yeah, and the engineers you need to come. And I'm sure they will also will come again in their team. And then they will send a report that at least the liquidity you are talking about, the fuel that is sent to them is being put into good use. And uh, the EDI, Eurojet, wants to finish this thing as quickly as possible. At the time of the visit, some staff of Eurojet, the invest contractors, were on site clearing weeds that had overtaken the buildings. Dusts that have engulfed some furniture were being cleaned in wait for engineering staff and other workers. Most medical equipment are under lock and key at the site with very delicate ones being stored at the warehouse. Dr. Insiasari dispels rumors the equipment is exposed to extreme weather conditions. My MRI uses helium. It's a magnet which turns around. Nobody will put MRI in non-air-conditioned room. So let get it straight. So whoever talks about MRI sitting in the sun, CT scan sitting in the sun, CT scan is a radiation material. If you put it outside, somebody even comes to sit on it. If you are a man, all your testicles will go. All the gonads, and then the, there will be nothing produced again. So nobody will allow such things to be sitting, equipment to be sitting in the sun. So it's not true. Meanwhile, Aerojet the Invest has expressed commitment to completing the project. Ahmed Abu Shama, main site manager. Look for when you're back to site, you can't back with full capacity when the same when in the same one night. You have to take some time to bring your skills, labors to come back and back work. And we have our labors already, so we already started. And then have uh, nowadays we have not less than 150 around 200 person per day. And we expect within two weeks we come back more than 400, 500. And the beginning of after Christmas we can reach more than 1,000. This is our expectation for the manpower to back to site. This is to be able to finish the project as recorded time. What is the Afari Military Hospital is one of nine health projects under Erojet the Invest. Some of the projects in the Ashanti region are yet to be completed, though it commenced decades ago. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima Kumasi. And that's how we uh, take. On this note, we take a break and bring you business shortly. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the business segment on Joy News Desk with me, Pius Kojobaka. Rural banks are introducing tailor-made products to improve agri-financing. For many people working in the agricultural sector, financing can be a deterrent. The high level of risk associated with lending to individuals in this sector continues to make financial institutions recalcitrant to grant loans to farmers. Here's more. Despite the government investments in agriculture, the sector is yet to achieve the desired results. 
Though the majority of the nation's population is engaged in agriculture, the country is unable to feed itself. With the increase in population, it is feared Ghana may fail to meet its food security targets. Due to financial constraints, mechanization and adoption of modern practices in agriculture remain a worry for many. As an intervention, the Achimakwama Raw Bank has introduced products to help farmers adopt modern technology for expansion. Chief Executive Officer Samuel Bunsusetre explains the impact of the bank's product on food security. And these are products that we give with a flexible repayment terms which are suited to the gestation period of the agri products that the farmers cultivate. And so when they come to us, we'll sit down with them, look at the particular areas that they are into. Because we don't have a one size fits all agri product for all farmers. We look at the kind of product that the farmer has and then we design our loan product to suit those uh, products so that the repayment will be comfortable for the farmer. We most of the time make our products to coincide with the harvest period. The Achuma Kwama Raw Bank has intensified its business advisory services. Beneficiary farmers are adding value to their production and accessing financial assistance from the bank. Meanwhile, the bank has offered support to five districts in its catchment for the organization of this year's Farmers' Day celebrations. They are, as I said, the bedrock of our economy and the support that we give, we believe, will encourage them to increase their output to feed the nation and also even include exports. As part of efforts to ensure eco-friendly buildings and guarantee environmental sustainability, players in the building and construction sector have stated that they are committed to offer products which will promote a green environment. Speaking to Joy Business, David Forson, Managing Director of Aubrey Engineering, suppliers of Ox Energy um, Conditions, explained that the promoting energy saving appliance will contribute to a sustainable environment. Here's a report. Encouraging a resource efficient method of construction that produces healthier buildings which have less impact on the environment is critical to promoting environmental sustainability. The use of eco-friendly appliances similarly contributes to ensuring a green environment. In view of this, Ox has indicated their commitment to provide eco-friendly air conditioners. David Forsing, Managing Director at Aubrey Engineering Limited, the sole distributor of Ox Air Conditions, disclosed this to Joy Business at a stakeholder forum which hosted players in the building and construction industry. Ox is a very innovative factory. Yes, with an inverter system that we run and they consume um, less energy. We also use um, R410 refrigerant for our air conditioners, which are ozone friendly. So uh, He disclosed the company's intention to invest in the Ghanaian economy by building a manufacturing plant. We are not looking at always importing from China. We've already initiated um, conversations to set up a plant here, still in the pipeline that we are considering. This will create jobs and also um, you know, we will take engineers from here, so it would you know, now every air conditioning technology that we are enjoying or using is from China or somewhere in Europe or you know, America. But then if we set up a plan here, it would help us to engage locally based engineers. So, I mean, their knowledge and all that can go into building some of these technologies used in air conditioning industry. Sales manager in charge of Africa at Ox, Eric Chai, explains the company's willingness to invest in the African market. The African market is a, has a big potential, but it needs some uh, uh, education and introduction. So this time, I I want to in the future I want to give more the 
uh, education about air conditioner knowledge and give our client to introdu uh, introduce our brand and pro uh, our good product to the Africa market. That's all for business. I am Pius Kujubaka. That's how we wrap up the bulletin this morning. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Log on to myjournline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. See you again at 12.